Hey guys, I'm Lucas and welcome to a K News special about Juno and gravity assists. Juno is a satellite which was sent on a 5 year long journey to Jupiter in 2011, launching on top an Atlas V rocket. The probe weighs 3.5 tons and has a hexagonal shape, meaning it has 6 flat surfaces, hence the Greek hex, which means 6. Mounted on the sides are 3 instead of the typical 2 solar panels to decrease the satellite's diameter down to 20 meters, limiting the forces they get exposed to during flight because it is a rotary spacecraft. This means it rotates around a center axis to enhance its stability during the long coasting phase. The satellite's electronics are placed inside such a thick titanium cube, protecting it against the harsh environment in space on the way to and around Jupiter. Two of the mentioned 3.5 tons mass are reserved for propellant, from which one part drives the liquid fueled main engine and the other the reaction control system. Next to that there is also a lot of scientific equipment on board and of course a communication antenna, which will point towards Earth most of the time. Liftoff was as mentioned in August 2011, the same year of the devastating tsunami and following nuclear disaster in Japan. Atlas V launched in its heavy 551 configuration and, since the satellite is relatively lightweight, it was strong enough to reach speeds necessary to escape our Earth and send Juno on a one-way trip to Jupiter. Just by the way, according to Roman mythology, Juno was Jupiter's wife <coughs> and sister, the analogue to Greeks Hera, which was Zeus' wife. Anyways, going to Jupiter is not as straightforward as it seems because although it is the biggest planet with the highest gravitational pull, leaving the inner solar system takes quite a lot of energy since the Earth is in comparison very close to the Sun. Jupiter's distance is at 780 million kilometers, more than 5 times longer and there is also the asteroid belt in between. However, latter has an estimated total mass of only 4% of our moon and the size of the belt makes hitting an object very unlikely. Now to make the whole process of getting to Jupiter more efficient, NASA uses a so called gravity assist or swing by maneuver. For a long time I thought to understand what happens in such an event, but thinking about it carefully it is actually not that self explanatory as it seems. Imagine this planet in the center and a satellite passing it. The gravity pulls the satellite towards the planet, speeding it up. It makes total sense, but once it passed the force pulls in the other direction, breaking it down again. So in total there should and actually is no net gain in velocity in a case like this. However in reality Juno was still somehow able to accelerate from such a maneuver and the key to that can only be found taking the sun into account. The planet a spacecraft is using for such a swing by revolves around the sun as well and in this speed lies the energy a satellite can harvest so to speak. The goal is to fly by in such a way that the satellite takes away some of the planet's momentum, breaking it down slightly and speeding itself up. This sounds dangerous, but since Juno is very light compared to a planet, the amount it takes away is negligible for the planet itself. To illustrate this a little, here a planet which moves in a circular fashion while the spacecraft in white is heading towards it. The speed increases as it comes closer and since it moves away, the satellite has more time to accelerate than it could was the planet standing still. I think this is very important to understand the gravity assist, but it's not all yet. Whether a swing by is useful or not highly depends on the trajectory. Such a flyby for example would result in almost no exchange in energy and doing this would actually decrease the satellite speed. This is how asteroids can be caught in a stable orbit around a planet using the planet's own moons as a gravity assist. Jupiter for example has 64 moons and many of it are indeed asteroid like. Now what Juno did leaving Earth is it flew an elliptic orbit around the Sun like so and performed a braking burn at its apoapsis to catch up with our Earth again to tackle it from the side as seen before 26 months into its flight. Setting up a maneuver node at the apoapsis and targeting Kerbin I can adjust my trajectory until I achieve an encounter. This hasn't to be precise yet since I can do the fine tuning on my way there as Juno did but for different reasons. The spacecraft is constantly hit by solar wind which shifts it around and the navigation precision in space has its limits as well. Doing the fine tuning I focus Kerbin and aim the spacecraft towards the different markers on the nav ball and do a test burn to see its impact. At this point I try not to overthink it since I don't have to conserve fuel as strictly as Juno has to. Next I aim my trajectory to fly by Kerbin closely to gain as much speed as possible getting pulled towards it. This doesn't look too bad and yes my apoapsis increases drastically. All this would be pointless however, if Juno would have launched without Jupiter or Joule in mind. The destination has to be at the right place when the mission begins which is a so called transfer window. 
There are different of these for every planet in the system and they of course also depend on the starting point. The easiest way is to simply look it up online but you can also find it out with a good old trial and error method like I do. Finally on the right track Juno again performs several course corrections using its reaction control system. The four major burns on the other hand are performed using its liquid fueled main engine and as mentioned the majority of Juno's mass is made up of propellant engines, its structure and solar panels. Since there is only little mass left for the actual scientific instruments they are chosen to be as simple as possible and that means there are no complex mechanisms to point the sensors in the correct direction for example. This is why the satellite will maintain its rotation even after it has arrived at its destination and it will do two revolutions per minute giving each instrument a fair portion pointing at Jupiter. There are eight scientific experiments in total and one color camera called JunoCam for educational purposes. This will not only allow students to study Jupiter's cloud features but also teach how to communicate and control a satellite experiment. Juno's main mission is to learn more about the inside of our biggest neighbor Jupiter. It is still not really known if it really has a solid core and how the giant formed in first place. Was it a collapsing gas cloud or maybe a rocky planet first? To find that out NASA picked a circular polar orbit of roughly 5000 km altitude to avoid the worst radiation belts. These are similar to Earth's Van Allen belts, just a lot stronger and more deadly. What makes them dangerous are high energetic charged particles which get trapped by the magnetic field. The stronger the field the more particles there are. To have a look inside Juno will use a radar for example to detect radiation from Jupiter's different layers hidden behind its massive hydrogen and helium clouds. Another very important part will be to study Jupiter's massive magnetic field coming from the inside which is not only responsible for the mentioned radiation belts but also creates auroras multiple times bigger than our whole planet. Jupiter's magnetic field extends so far into space some of its moons are covered by it and actually influence the auroras on Jupiter's poles. There are aurora spots for each inner moon on the poles which can help to understand how all this works as well. Measuring a magnetic field basically works like a compass. The arrow points along the field and by looking at the stars the instrument can tell how Juno is oriented. From that Juno will obtain a map of such arrows all around Jupiter and scientists will not only be able to calculate the resulting outside field but will also be able to get more clues about what exactly causes these strong fields inside the gas giant. Our earth has an iron core which conducts electricity and all the friction inside produces strong electric currents. Jupiter on the other hand is believed to have an outer core of liquid hydrogen which gets compressed high enough to reach a new phase called metallic hydrogen. This new phase requires immense amounts of pressure and in that state hydrogen might also act as a superconductor even at room temperature. There is a lot of science like this done in space which helps us understand things on earth as well and I'm really looking forward to hear more about Juno in the upcoming days and months. Juno finally arrives at Jupiter as I speak and is currently performing its first maneuvers to get captured in a stable orbit. For the first 100 days Juno will orbit in a very elliptic fashion to correct its inclination efficiently. After that the next major burn will put it in its final circular science orbit where it will revolve around Jupiter 33 times and hopefully deliver a lot new and awesome data. At the end of its life after roughly a year when all the correction burns exhausted its propellant it will decrease its orbit until it touches the atmosphere and will burn up in Jupiter's thick clouds hopefully transmitting a few less pictures from up close. Now in the end a huge shout out to all my patrons. The list got quite a bit longer in June and a big thank you for that. Okay this episode was a can you special about Juno and gravity assists and I hope to see you in the next one if you like. Auf Wiedersehen and thank you for watching.